Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about the poetry of A.E. Hausman. Um, for some reason that I, I just can't really explain, I have long kind of been resistant to reading Hausman's work. Uh, I don't, I don't know what it is because for some reason I have had a bad taste in my mouth about him. I've read to an athlete dying young before. That's one of Hausman's most famous and most anthologized poems. I'm reasonably certain that I read it at the very least in an undergrad Brit Lit seminar, um, or an undergrad Brit Lit survey, rather. It's not my favorite of his poems. I, I don't hate it as I reread it, but it's not something that I would necessarily want to come back to. However, there's a couple of his other poems here in the Norton Anthology of English Literature, which is where I'm reading his a very small selection of his work, uh, that I actually really do like. Um, so the first three poems in this anthology, Loveliest of Trees, When I Was One and Twenty, and To an Athlete Dying Young, they're all... Carpe Diem poems, which is a, a particular traditional form, especially going back to Latin poetry. And, and Hausman made his living as a professor of Latin literature, and so that definitely impacted the way he approached his own poetry. Um, the Carpe Diem poem basically is a life is short and so enjoy eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow ye may die, type poem, uh, central to the philosophy of the film uh, Dead Poets Society, if you know that. Um, Robin Williams's character in that encourages the students to seize the day directly. Um, Hausman's Carpe Diem poems are somewhat more fatalistic than others. They're somewhat more... They acknowledge the negative experience that goes along with seizing the day, right? That you may, you may have enjoyment, you may have a response, and yet central to the premise of that is you will die. You will age, you will decay, you will die. And Hausman puts that kind of front and center. center. So the first of the poems in this anthology is Loveliest of Trees, which I, I actually quite like. <clears throat> so, Loveliest of Trees. Loveliest of trees, the cherry now is hung with bloom among the bow, along the bough, and stands about the woodland ride, wearing white for Easter tide. Now my, of my three score years and ten, twenty will not come again, and take from seventy springs a score, it only leaves me fifty more. And since to look at things in bloom, fifty springs are little room, about the woodlands I will go to see the cherry hung with snow. So... We've got a lot going on here. Um, we have the beauty of the cherry trees themselves. Loveliest of trees, the cherry now is hung with bloom about the bough. Um, wearing white for Easter tide is the end of the first stanza. And of course, Easter represents this complicated interplay of Christ's death, but also Christ's resurrection and the redemption of humanity into eternal life, etc., etc. That whole shtick. I mean, that is sort of the core of Christian theology. Um, it is a moment of redemption, salvation, and life, despite the fact that the crucifixion is a moment of death. And so we have that interplay here, that this is set in the period around 
Easter. Um, the next the next stanza is about the brevity of life, right? Now of my three score years and ten twenty will not come again, and take from seventy springs a score, it leaves me uh, it only leaves me fifty more. Life is short. This is where we get into the carpe diem aspect, right? Seize the day, life is short, eat, drink, and marry, and be merry, for tomorrow you may die. Um, and then the next stanza, I think, again, complicates things. It, it twists the, the ethos here. And since to look at things in bloom, fifty springs are little room, about the woodlands I will go to see the cherry hung with snow. Life is short. And since to look at things in bloom, fifty springs are little room, life is short, sees the day, and yet, about the woodlands I will go to see the cherry hung with snow. Now this is an interesting image because in the first stanza, we find out that the cherries are in bloom. So they are, they are in white. They're not in snow, but they're in white. But snow, often particularly in pastoral poetry, reflects winter, death, the end of the season of bounty, the season of growth, the season of greenery particularly in English poetry. Um, Houseman was from, um, Wor yeah, Worcestershire, um, in the West Midlands area of England. Is a, it, to this day, the West Midlands area is a pretty agrarian, rural, and small towns type area. Um, and so, Snow is going to have that association for rural people with the hard times of winter when food is not growing and you're depending on whatever has been stored up from the summer, the fall, spring, etc., etc. And so, the, on the one hand, the snow visually aligns with the cherry blossoms, a signal of life, of bounty, of beauty, because of the whiteness. On the other hand, the snow aligns with death, privation, suffering, winter time. And so we've got these conflicting signals here. Um, the other one that I want to talk about is When I Was One and Twenty. This is another Carpe Diem poem in which the penalties of carpeing the Diem are not ignored. So, when I was one and twenty, I heard a wise man say, Give crowns and pounds and guineas, but not your heart away. Give pearls away and rubies, but keep your fancy free. But I was one and twenty, no use to talk to me. When I was one and twenty, I heard him say again, The heart out of the bosom was never given in vain. Tis paid with sighs a plenty and sold for endless rue, And I am two and twenty, and oh, tis true, tis true. So yeah, I mean, this is a, a seize the day poem. Your elders may counsel, caution, but in the ardor and joy and joie de vivre of, of youth, you pursue love, you pursue pleasure, you pursue joy, and then that leads to suffering. Um, yeah, I mean, it is this, <laughs> in a way it's an anti-punk poem. Uh, it is very much a your elders are wise, and you shall also become wise by learning from your mistakes. Um, and it's not clear that that's necessarily a bad thing. Like, this is, this is the complication I see in the poem, or the, the sort of ambiguity I see in the poem, is 
Yes, the the poet persona suffers, and oh, tis true, tis true. Um, this idea that that um, giving your heart away, loving leads to suffering. The poet persona agrees with this, but it's not. It's not necessarily clear that it is a bad thing to have learned that life lesson. It is, I would say, in my reading at least, this is open-ended in terms of whether or not this is something that the poet or the poet persona is critiquing. Um, This, I think, depends on your ethical outlook about the world, how you might want to read this. Is this a poem saying a wise person learns from the follies of others rather than having to make their own mistakes? Or is this a poem saying the path to wisdom is fraught with suffering and with errors? I think it can be either way. Either this can be a story of you should have taken my advice, then you wouldn't be suffering. Or this can be a story of the only way to genuinely learn this life experience is by going through the pain and, and feeling that, experiencing that, suffering that for yourself. 